So welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining me for my presentation. Let me quickly introduce myself. I'm Jan. I'm working for the Open Source Automation Development Lab. We are a German cooperative and we support our members in using open source in their products. That covers different aspects. So we support our members in technical aspects and in legal aspects as well. And the topic I brought for today, I would say, is something in between. So if you stayed in this room the whole day, you heard a lot about Yocto and build systems. This is pretty much what I want to cover, but I want to cover today a specific aspect. I want to look into uh, licensing obligations you have with open source software when you copy and distribute open source software. And um, together we want to see how far a build system or distro generator can support you in creating the needed material. And well, how far that support goes and what still remains to be done on your own, right? So this is pretty much what we want to cover within the next 40 minutes. So I am aware that the, the topic of build systems is a huge topic, right? So there's many different things we could possibly cover. So looking at my personal history, when I started with embedded Linux like a bit more than 20 years ago, um, well, we just built everything from scratch, which is, I mean, it was fun, that's okay. <laughs> I learned a lot, but today we're in a lucky situation that we don't have to do that anymore, right? So we have some build systems that support us in building our systems and there's different strategies in doing so. So if you've been to, to Michael's talk before, we've been looking into binary distributions. So when you, when you choose a build system today for your project, you usually have the choice between you build stuff from source or, I mean, you reuse binary packages, for example, from a pre-existing distribution like Debian. And these are basically the, when it comes to license compliance, the two approaches I wanted to, to look into and see how we can put together license compliance material and what could be the right strategies. So I had to pick a choice, right? Um, I mean, for distribution generators, there's PTX disk, build root, Yocto. When you build, for example, Debian-based systems, there's LB, ESAR, there's DevOps, there, there's way more, right? So I had to pick a few choices. So when it comes to building stuff from source, I've been looking extensively into the Yocto project and what you can do. Um, for the distribution builders, I picked LB and ESAR, but um, I mean, when you look at my finding, it's pretty much, it applies to every other approach as well. When we look into what you need to do on your own and where a build system can support, right? So before we get straight and um, trying to answer the question on how a build system can support us, let's do a very quick recap on what you really need to do when it comes to license compliance, right? And um, I mean, we're all using open source. Um, the great thing about open source, if you just use it, I mean, there's not much you really need to do, right? You can just take it and use it. The fun starts when you start redistributing it, right? Then there's obligations you need to fulfill. And um, I try to summarize the obligations we usually have with open source licensing into four different categories, right? And then later looking into several build systems on how they could support us in fulfilling these obligations. So first of all, and this is the most obvious thing, we always have information obligations. So this is the bare minimum every open source license tells us that we need to provide, that we need to forward the license texts, right? Because we need to inform the recipient of the software what he is allowed to do and what he needs to do when he redistributes. This is a bit more, there's other licenses requesting warranty disclaimers to be provided or even to provide modification notices to clearly define what you have modified in the software or to provide any kind of acknowledgement. So we could summarize that in providing and forwarding information, right? Well, there's licenses like GPL2 that also asks us to disclose source code. So we need to provide the complete and corresponding source code for the software, um, including clearly marking modifications. So it needs to be clear what is the original source code and what has been modified. And people often forget about that fact. We also need to provide build and installation instructions, right? So this is also something we need to do. So this is what we could categorize with disclosure obligations. Third part, 
maybe getting a bit more complex. There's something we could call licensing obligations. A good example here is like looking into copyleft-based licenses. So that means, um, for example, if you modify the Linux kernel, that creates a derivative work, right? And that derivative work needs to go under the original license. So you always keep the original license, that's what we call copyleft, and this is what we could categorize as a licensing obligation, right? And last but not least, bit generic category I built here, so everything that did not fit in the other three categories, but there's a bit more you need to do, right? Um, people also often forget that you might need to adjust your company documents. So usually you give precedence to open source licensing terms in your general terms and conditions. Or another great example is uh, looking at the LGPL, uh, which requires us to allow re-engineering of linked software. So the so-called reverse engineering clause, that's Sounds a bit scary, but it, it's at the end of the day just contractual work, right? So these are things um, that have to be done when we copy and distribute open source software. Now, um, but how can a build system support here, right? So now if we start thinking about these different categories, it's obvious that providing information is something where a build system can support. Um, Disclosing source code and providing build and installation instructions is definitely something where build system support. Licensing obligations, well, the build system can deliver the information we need, maybe how components interact and under which license they come, but the rest of the work needs to be done on my own. And when it comes to contractual work, well, I don't think there's a way how a build system can support, right? So the I mean, the important message, and maybe that's the key takeaway from this presentation, please do not forget there's always some manual work left. Um, we, so, we often see that people just think, okay, I just take what the build system is generating and I accompany my product with that material and then I'm done. Well, that's part of the job, but there's additional work you always need to do, right? So please do not forget about that. So now, um, since it seems to be obvious, that uh, information obligations and disclosure obligations can be heavily supported by the build system. Let's see how Yocto and the other approaches can support us here and uh, where we are on that uh, topic. Okay, so um, I think looking at the audience, there's not much need to explain the background of the Yocto project, so I'm going to skip that. Um, let's start with the basics. So this is just from a standard Pocky build building a minimal core image, looking at some um, material that is being created with every single build. And this is a good starting point when we look into license compliance, right? Because first of all, we usually want to have an overview of what's inside the build, right? And which licenses are behind. Because this is the material we later need to connect. So there's a few files that are always being generated with a Yocto build, like the image license manifest that's mainly components that are not part of the root file system but might be needed for boot. Then most importantly, license manifest, it's basic license information for all packages, just to give you an idea how that overview looks like. So, I mean, you would get the package name, the version, the recipe that's behind. And most importantly, when we look at license compliance, you see the license under which this component comes, right? So for Linux kernel, uh, is GPL2 only mentioned here, so that at a first glance looks correct, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So, um, last but not least, you also get a list of the packages installed to the image. That is, I mean, not as relevant as having the complete overview of what is coming under which license. Um, now, knowing that there's information we always need to provide, right? We need to see does the build system already support us here? So with Yocto, there's a few settings you could add to your build configuration, to your local conf. So you could say copy license manifest or copy license dears, which basically tells to copy the relevant information into the root file system. Um, that's important because we need to forward the license text, right? Um, so having these settings done, the license text will be copied to the root file system. They will be on the product and you, could probably get, make them accessible for the end user. So that is already a, a very good basis and in providing information uh, that, you, that you need to provide, right? But as always, um, starting with the basis, whenever we 
provide information or when we include information, we usually should ask ourselves, where does this information come from? Is it correct? And most importantly, when it comes to license compliance, is it complete, right? So looking into the information from the license manifest, I mean, that's quite easy to get, right? Um, this is some information this is, which is maintained in the recipe of that specific package, so we just fetch the license from there. This is, ends up in the license manifest. And that's basically it. So um, question is, is this enough? Let's think about that. So, we're talking about the Linux kernel, GPL2 sounds correct, but wait a second, there was something like a syscall exception, maybe we want to mention that right here, so maybe a small gap. So we might want to look at this specific kernel version and scan it for license information and look at the results to see is this information complete or might we be missing anything. So I did so, um, I, I did a, a scan code run. Um, on, on 6.6.35, just looking uh, into how many unique license expressions I could find in that kernel version. So want to make any guess? One, two, three, four, ten. <laughs> Seven hundred. Seven, ah, it's actually less. <laughs> it's way better than that. Um, it's just 100. Uh, 102. So th don't be scared. That is unique license expressions that could be GPL2 with syscall expression or GPL2 or later. It's just um, 100 unique expressions. So it's usually GPL and variants. Uh, everything is compatible. Kernel is in very good shape, but there's also, I mean, mostly the historical stuff in the kernel might come under other licenses. So all, everything you usually has a SPDX license identify as clearly licensed under GPL2. It's a lot of historical stuff. So you might miss MIT. BSD and a few others, um, which is, I mean, not a very big deal, but it is information that you need to provide, right? So, and if you just focus on GPL2, you miss that information. So you did not provide everything that you would need. So the, the next step here is instead of looking into the license information on package level, we might want to look into the license information on a file level, right? Um, so if you joined the, the Yoktobov before, um, it was already quickly mentioned on how to create SPDX material and, and where's that work. This is exactly the next thing I want to mention in, in this presentation. So there's already a lot of great work being done in creating bill of materials with a, with a Yocto build. This, I mean, I cannot cover everything in this presentation. We'll pretty much focus on the licensing information. So um, Open a Better brings a class which is called Create SPDX. So if you just do a, a build on a recent Pocky version, this should be inherited by default, so nothing for you to do. Um, if you're coming from an industrial background, sometimes you're caught with older versions, right? Sometimes. Um, in that case, you just need to inherit the create SPDX class to, to ask uh, a bit of material uh, being, being created for the build on a file level. So there's a, there's a few settings here. I uh, just want to quickly cover these. You can also tell a bit on how that material is being created. Um, I would highly recommend to, to set SPDX pretty because otherwise everything will be printed in one line, which is okay if you want to have a machine or a tool read that, but if a human being should read that, so you might, have it, might want to have it properly formatted. You can also ask for several stuff to be included, like a description of the source files used to build the host tools and stuff. You could ask uh, the sources of the packages being installed to be archived and also the binaries. This, I mean, looking into disclosure obligations, there's a few additional features. For now, I would like to quickly focus on the information obligations and, and drive that thought a bit further, right? So we have the possibility to create file-based licensing information with the bill of material. And um, we get, I mean, we get that on certain levels. So there's a certain hierarchy like some files describing the image and the components that are inside the image. What I'm interested right now is to look into how are the packages being described. So what information is recorded for all the packages that go into the root file system, right? And I picked uh, Busybox just as a random example here. So this is, uh, would be some SPDX material that has been created from that build. 
So first of all, this is the overall package information. So we know which, what is the package. We get a um, we get a checksum on the on the tarball, and we know what is the overall licensing. So this is definitely the information we had so far. But what we wanted to have is to look into the license information on a file level, right? So let's just pick a random file and see what information we got from that build, right? Um, so you see, actually, we get the file information, but if we have a closer look um, for copyright texts, for example, or license information, we see no assertion, which means that we did not catch anything for that. Uh, the reason here is, is I mean, the, the class is really looking into the files, but uh, there's certain information this class is looking for. So mostly at the moment, it's just looking into uh, if there's any statements with a SPDX license identifier, right? So if a li SPDX license identifier would be stated, this would be caught, otherwise we would miss it. So if there's anyone in the room who has been dealing with license compliance before, you know that um, human creativity is basically endless, right? So, and there are endless ways in stating license information in open source packages. Uh, luckily enough, nowadays we have standards like SPDX license identifiers, for example, the Linux kernel is very, doing a very good job there. But um, for, I mean, projects that are very long on the market, we still have many files that have the license text or link or anything else included, right? So we need to catch that information as well. And well, we, we didn't catch it so far. So if we really want to go to the level that we want to have to catch all licenses, we need to think how we can um, catch that. And I think that there was a question coming up in the uh, buff before, like can I use scan code or phosology or anything else in that, in that process? And this is actually something I was looking into. Uh, is there something out there that helps me to integrate this uh, into a Yocto build? So um, the first thing I looked into is a layer which is called uh, Meta SPDX Scanner. It's around for quite a few years. So the main intention is basically to provide classes to integrate common open source licensing scanners to a Yocto build, right? Um, there's a few integrations. There's even a Black Duck integration. So I focused on the open source tools and I just had a quick look at the scan code integration of that layer. So the main intention is that for every package that would make it into your build, you would run a open source license scanner and then pro, uh, pro, uh, produce per file license information. Attention, I mean, you only do that once, but that might take a while, right? Because you scan every single file for license information. Um, integration of that layer is, is fairly easy. I mean, you just put it um, to your configuration. It's, um, it's, it sits on top of the CVE check class. So you inherit the CVE check class and then you inherit the class of the relevant scanner you want to use, uh, either for Solidity or scan code and so on. I have to admit that um, for me, it didn't run out of the, of the box. So it needed a bit of love but maybe it's something in the area of one hour and a few lines of Python code, I got it running. So it was actually not too hard to get it running. And um, let's, let's have a brief look at the, at the result. So this is the information that has been created with the next run with Meta XPDX Scanner. So first of all, I caught all the uh, copyright statements which got extracted. So this is also an obligation you usually have with the information to provide the copyright information and the next step is that if you look now into the file information, so if you look right here, for this uh, C file, we didn't catch the license before. Now we caught it because we, we did run a real open source license scanner, right? So in this case, we just did automatically run scan code on that. So this brought us a step further, right? So we have per file information, we have real scanning data, but, um, this is just a scanner finding, right? The problem with that can be sometimes license information needs manual review. Coming back of the topic of human creativity, right? Um, there's many ways in stating licenses. So usually open source licensing scanners are really good, doing a great job, but sometimes you really need manual review, right? Um, but we don't have that information right now. So it was just a scanning tool running 
over the code, which is way better. But I mean, we would love to have information that has been manually reviewed and provided by a human being to, to be sure that this information is really be correct. So how can we solve that issue? Because this is also some kind of meta information we don't have so far, right? Um, that brings me to the next topic, uh, to a layer which is called Meta Ocelot, that is integrating a pro project which is called Ocelot. Um, I just want to quickly cover this. Um, so we're pretty much limited in time. So if you want to want know more, just go to the project page, www.ocelot.org. The main idea is to build up a database with license compliance material for commonly used open source packages, uh, which means not just scanning data. So it's really reviewed and curated data that goes into a database. So you could look up if your package is already there and get the data from there instead of recreating the same data over and over again. So this is the, the main idea of Meta Ocelot, uh, of Ocelot, right? Providing such a database. So check out the web page to learn more about that. So what Meta Ocelot does is, um, this is the GitHub link. If you, if you want to give it a try, it's um, maintained by Jasper Oshulko. It's, it's great work. I uh, actually really enjoyed looking into that layer. The main idea is instead of just running uh, an open source licensing scanner for all the packages. For every package, you would look into the database and see if you have a match for that or any version close to what you are currently using and then fetch the licensing data from there. So, I mean, the open source ecosystem is huge. You would never be able to build up a database for providing the data for all the versions that are out there on the market, right? But you could pick a version close and based on the file checksums, you can decide if, you, if the files are identical. You could just take the license information from the database. If not, you need just to hint that, okay, this needs to have some manual care and some manual review, right? Uh, this is the main idea. So it is um, also easy to integrate. Just fetch the layer, activate it. There's a lot of fine tuning you could probably do just trying to uh, tell you the overall picture. Uh, it introduces a new target, which is called Populate Ocelot, um, which will create a subdirectory for every single package, which has uh, two different things. First of all, it's the compliance data fetched from the repository. Basically, it's just a Git repository hosted on GitHub, nothing more. All the compliance data is there. And you get a JSON file that tells you um, which files are identical or which files might need manual care when reviewing. So how does that look like? So this is just for my example build. So OpenSSL made it into the root file system. So we've been using 3.2.2, which is not available in the database, but we got 3.2.0. So we're going to pick that, right? And in that uh, metadata file, we'll just um, get told, OK, these files have a different checksum. So Please do not blindly take the compliance information. So these might have might need manual care, right? But uh, we have a perfect match for these. So you could just reuse the data, which is already curated there. So this this is the main idea. There's way, way more I could tell here. So if you want to learn more, I just wanted to, to use the opportunity. So we're going to run a webinar next week, which is free. So everyone can uh, join that. Um, QR code will just take you directly to the registration page. It's next Wednesday afternoon. If you can make it, if you cannot make it, no worries. We will drop you an email after the webinar and you can download the video and all the presentation material for free. So that will tell a bit more about the idea of the Ocelot project and uh, the Meta Ocelot layer, just in case I rang your interest and you want to learn a bit more, right? So, um, already like 25 minutes and we spent all the time talking about information obligations, right? But it's an important topic, specifically the quality and the completeness of the material. So this is some way we could go together that people learn in like sharing compliance material, maintain compliance material in a repository. Um, to give you the complete picture, we also need to talk about disclosure obligations, right? This, um, if you're look, looking into the Yocto project, there's several ways. There's also an archiver that could archive the original source code for you. 
also the patched and configured source code. So remember, you need the complete and corresponding source code. You need to provide building installation instructions. So this is something important you need. And um, you could also just uh, choose to get the patch source code. So to summarize it, the, the support you get for um, disclosure obligation is pretty complete, right? So the, the gap you usually have is when it comes to information, fulfilling information obligations, right? So this is pretty much the, the picture here. So I promised you, we've got like 15 minutes left. I also promised you to look into other approaches as well. Right, so now this is a bit the Yocto project part, but how does the situation look like if you look into reusing a pre-existing Linux distribution like Debian? So for that purpose, I also did a couple of example builds with uh, Elbe. Maybe that might need a bit of um, explanation. Not sure if anyone is aware of the Elbe project. At the end of the day, it's basically a tool that helps you to have reproducible builds, builds for a Debian-based file system. Um, you have your target root file system described in an XML file, and you get a reproducible build, and everything is based on the packages that can come from a Debian repository. That's pretty much it. This is mostly the structure. So the main idea is the build is running inside a virtual machine, which has a defined Debian environment to keep the reproducibility, right? And the XML file tells how that installation looks like. You can choose any mirror, could be a custom mirror and so on. And what we want to look into right now is which build artifacts are being created, right? So, and compare it a bit maybe to the Yocto project. And we will see there's a lot of overlap and looking into the gaps, it's actually pretty much the same, right? So looking at what Elbe could produce, so this is the, the usual result you get from an Elbe build. Um, apart from the root file system that you could flash to your target, what you would get is a binary CD-ROM. That's basically all the binary packages that have been used for that build. So you see, we, have, we had a very similar function um, for Yocto as well, so archiving all the binary binary stuff. Um, we also get a file that contains all the license and copyright information. This goes towards the direction we, we've seen with Yocto with the license manifest and the bill of material that we could create, right? So um, we have similar things here. So LB chooses that you get a text file and you also get a XML file here. So it, the idea is pretty similar in the information that is produced. There's um, also a source XML. That's a pretty interesting idea that uh, could be used as an input for the next build. So it completely describes the build you currently have done, and together with the binary CD-ROM, you could reproduce exactly the same build you have currently done, right? And last but not least, what Elbe would uh, produce for you is a ESO image with all the Debian source packages. So looking at that information, we already have covered a lot, right? So looking at the information obligations, we see that this is targeted with this information right here, and the disclosure obligation is targeted with providing the Debian source packages. They have the original source code, they have the packages, and they have clear build instructions. So also we could summarize that also with this idea, we are pretty much fine with the disclosure obligations, right? But we need to think, once again, how complete is the information like the license text and the copyright information. So also here we need to ask the question, where does the information come from? This is just an example uh, from, a, from a random Elbe build, like looking into the license file that is being generated. So um, at the end of the day, this information roots us back to the source package, right? and the meta information, which is stated in that source package, which brings us back to the, if you have a closer look at that information, to, to make the story short, that um, this information is not always complete or sometimes even wrong. It is, if we, if we compare it to what we learned about the Yocto project, it's once again that we have the information, but not everything, right? It's, it's pretty much the same gap we have here. Um, and um, the, the same solutions would apply here, right? So we could either start running our own open source license scanner or we work together with others and see if we could build up a database to, to reuse this kind of data, right? But we're we are pretty much 
at the at the same level, right? There's, there's a few more features the LB would, would bring you um, that make life a bit more easy. That, that's just some, some details, but uh, depending on which Debian version you are using, uh, the packages do not have necessarily SPDX compliant license identifiers, so LB does give you some support in providing a mapping, like if you find a certain license identifier, you could then translate it, for example, to, to a SPDX license, uh, license identifier. So th there's a few more features to make things a bit more convenient, but that still doesn't solve the problem that we have information, but it might be incomplete, right? So um, last but not least, this was Elbe, right? Um, there's one more left I quickly want to mention, but it's, I mean, it's very, very similar. Um, so if you're familiar with geography and a bit of Germany, you might get the word game of Elbe and ISAR. Uh, Elbe was first and then the ISAR project came up. And I actually wanted to mention that because it is something in between. So we covered Yocto and we covered Debian. And the ISAR project is something in between. Um, interestingly, they heavily base on Debian. You can use Debian binary packages, uh, but they are using BitBake. And you can also write custom recipes. So the main idea, I try to cover it in that image a bit. The main idea is that you only rebuild the things that you really want to build. And for the rest, you could reuse it from an existing distribution like Debian. That was the main intention when they started with ESA, which is an idea I pretty much like. So um, you, you've got the ESA layers. You could get binary packages from the Debian project. Um, you could put certain layers on top that could rely on binary packages, but these could also bring in custom software that is built from scratch. So it's, it's a mixture of both worlds. Like we could even say it's getting the best of both worlds. I actually pretty much like that approach. And um, well, but since we've learned about the gaps we have with Yocto and the gaps we have with Debian, since ESA is a combination of both, I mean, you know, then we have the same gaps, obviously, as well. So looking at the information that is being uh, generated, this is just a very brief summary. So you get also a manifest file being created, but also ESA is relying on the Debian or Yocto Meta information. So we do have that gap in information. And um, this is pretty much the, the same as, as, we, as we learned for ALB, right? So there's, there's not much difference. When it comes to disclosure obligations. There's also pretty good support for ESAR. So you could, um, with the base repo features, you could ask to download all the Debian source packages for the binaries that made it into the build. So this is pretty much similar to the source CD-ROM that Elbe is generating for you. And uh, I mean, all the custom packages could be picked up, for example, from the work directory. It is maybe a bit more manual work, but you could also cover disclosure obligations quite well when you're using ESAR. And this applies, I mean, for all the other approaches you have around there. Um, so that's always pretty much the same. So now um, to conclude, maybe to compare things a bit. And I, I, I tried to prepare a few tables comparing the approaches and what you can do and not to do. And it turned out that at the end of the day, everything looks pretty similar and brings us to the same point. So we started with Yocto looking at the information obligations. So we saw that we get the license information, but it might be incomplete. So we might need additional layers and some additional work, right? Um, copyright notices are by default missing. We also need a few additional layers. Um, we need the manual effort for warranty disclaimers and acknowledgements as well, but we could get these, for example, from our databases like Ocelot. When it comes to disclosure obligations like modification notices, build instructions, patches, this is where we have a very good state, right? I mean, for information obligations, we have a very good basis and we need to decide if you want to live with that gap or if you want to fill that gap. For disclosure obligations, we are doing pretty well, right? And this is pretty much the same for like the distribution-based approaches as well. Um, we've seen that license and copyright information was not complete, so we need to fill that gap, right? But when it came to disclosure obligations, we had everything we needed, right? So this was the case for Elbe. 
Um, it looked a slightly different when looking um, at ESAR, but at the end of the day, we had the same state for license and copyright information, but when it comes to fulfilling disclosure obligations, things look uh, quite well also here. So that, I know this was quite a lot for 40 minutes, right? So there's a few things I want to conclude and I want to I wanna summarize here. First of all, build systems can always support us uh, with fulfilling license obligations and it is highly recommended to use that support, right? Please do not forget, apart from the gaps I've mentioned here, there is always manual work you need to invest. So, I mean, we, together we need to work on that build systems can do more, so we reduce the manual effort, right? But there is always something you need to invest. There's no chance at all, right? So please have that in mind. Developers should be aware, and specifically your management should be aware that there is this effort you need, right? I mean, it's a, it's a matter of copyright law at the end of the day, right? Um, to summarize the gaps we have looked into, we've learned that distro generators, they offer very strong support in fulfilling disclosure obligations. That's like in the pure nature on how the systems are being built, right? Um, we have a good or solid basis when it comes to fulfilling ob uh, information obligations, but we've identified some gaps, right? So there might be missing licenses, there might be missing copyright information. Um, so at the end of the day, someone needs to look at the source code, scan it and provide that information. Now, another key message today for this presentation is we should all think if it wouldn't be a good idea to share this kind of efforts as well, right? So we're working a lot together with open source with the technical aspects, but fulfilling license obligations is something we all need to do as well, right? It doesn't make any sense at all that we all do the same reviews over and over again. So I think it's time to learn that we improve the situation, that we share compliance information, um, and also push back that information to the projects, right? Also improve, if you have any finding when reviewing, let the projects know how they could do a better job in providing license information. Um, one example is the Ocelot project that offers an umbrella to share that information. So if you want to learn more about that, just let me know. Uh, there might be other ways, but I think it would be great if we work more together when it comes to open source licensing. So that uh, pretty much concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I'll be around for the rest of the week. So if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. And looking at the time, um, I think we still have time to answer some questions right now. So first of all, thank you. So there's a question right here and back there. Do we have a mic that I could give around? Otherwise, just go ahead with your question. I'm going to repeat it. Okay, the, yeah. the question is, maybe to put it a more generic, how is the data for the Ocelot project being generated? So you've been asking specifically about the copyright information, but also for the license information. So it's a manual review process. Um, so the, the people currently working on that are mostly using Phosology and manual review. That means using uh, the scanners that are available in Phosology, so it's Monk, Nomos, and Ojo, and in the additional, the scan code integration, and then manually going over the data and, and um, putting, putting it there. So it, at the end of the day, answer is, it is manual effort, and this is the pure idea of the project that we could share this manual effort, because each and anyone is using the same open source packages, and every company is doing this effort over and over again, and this was the pure idea where we came up with the, with the Ocelot project to provide an umbrella where people could share this, this information. So if you go to the project page, we even have videos describing on uh, what you need to do to contribute. I have to be honest with you, it's still a pretty young project, so don't expect there thousands of packages, like 
we have a starting point like 200 or something unique packages mm -hmm. but uh, go to the project page and look at the existing data you will find everything there and if you want to contribute just let us know um, we're also happy to support you in, in providing data because we, we think it's highly important that we work together on that topic that sounds interesting uh, back there Hi, uh, Denver Gingrich from uh, Software Freedom Conservancy. I was wondering when you mentioned um, some of the manual uh, ne necessary work um, toward the end, if you were talking about um, some of the things you mentioned earlier, which were um, installation instructions, is that the yeah. sort of manual um, work you're talking about? Um, no, this is actually some, this is not the manual work I've been talking about. The manual work is really the, what, what I just mentioned in creating the data. So, um, or, or do, do, do you mean the, the gap I mentioned that is? Yeah, well, you mentioned earlier ah, okay, as part I see, of yeah. disclosure. So I, th this was basically the summary of um, there's always additional work needed, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, providing building installation instructions is maybe part of that work, but it's already highly covered by the build systems. So if you provide a standard build system where documentation is available, this is the easy part. So I was mostly talking about the adjustment of company documents, for example. Um, so that there might be some contractual work, which is not a big deal, but people have to be aware that they need to do that work, right? Or like the uh, permission for reverse engineering that you might need to give in a contract if you like deliver LGPL based software. So this, this was like more the manual work I, I was referencing. To. I see. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering if there was maybe like a prompt or something that the build tool provided to say, um, here's where you insert the information for how to install this onto the device. Because um, I think not, Yocto not, not the build system. But okay. there's, there's a project that might help you here. Uh, something we started also at OSADL, which is also completely open source, is our license, check, license obligation checklist project. So the thing is, with the build system, you might get a, a big list of the licenses that are inside your, your product, right? And now you need to derive the obligations, like I need to provide a written offer, I need to provide a uh, warranty disclaimer. This is what we do with the license obligation checklist. So it's basically translating um, common open source licenses into a canonical language, um, like you must, uh, you must forward, you must provide, and so on. And we even offer a graphical tool where you could um, basically click your use case, like I'm doing a binary delivery, I'm deciding to, um, to do a delayed source code delivery, and then you get a list of what you need to do, and we even provide text templates on how a written offer could look like or how you need to, to adjust your company document. So it's not the build system, but um, this is where you should look at our checklist project. Great, thanks. So one comment here, and then we have a question there. Yeah, regarding these uh, uh, build instructions, uh, Bitbig actually generates a, a script out of the tasks that it executes. It's what we call the run scripts. And usually you have a quite, let's say, executable um, set of commands that you can run to reproduce the build. Yeah. It's a shell Great. script. Great, yeah. So then maybe you can take one last question here. Um, I have a question about the, um, the, the Let's say the, the term GPL. So we, we uh, had the Yocto build uh, that produced a long list of licenses that were used and we checked those license texts and there were several, a lot of variants of the GNU public license version 2 and some of the difference were easy to spot like the year or the name of the author or something like that. Of course, white spaces, but actually there were difference like inserted words like not yeah, so GPL or GNU public license is probably not a protected trademark, so you can call any license GNU public license. How to deal with that? Is it just with a SPDX identifier or how do you rely on that? Yeah, so I mean, from the, from the user's perspective, this is the hardest part. From, I mean, if you want to state the license, the easy answer would be just use a standard like SPDX license identifier, so it's clearly, clearly marked what you want to do. The, um, the tricky part really comes when, okay, you, you have the license text and you need to spot is this 
a variant or did someone just add a sentence or remove a sentence? Um, the only thing here is, you, I mean, you, you need to use tooling, right? I mean, you need to, to use Phosology, scan code, whatever, to really spot these changes. Um, and then someone needs to look into that. I, I think there's no common way. I mean, we are aware of these variants, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this GPL is just one example. There's many other licenses where you just uh, add a sentence or, I mean, add another, invent another exception to that license and so on and so on. But the only clear answer to that is if you're a user and you want to know what's inside, you, you need to really look into the tooling. And if it cannot be identified, you need to ask a, a legal person to look into that and let you know what you need to do or not. And if, if you clearly identify the license, then you look at the OSADL checklist, and then that tells you what you need to do. Okay. So, okay, we're, we're pretty over time, but let's take one last, last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned human creativity as yes. standards. Um, that would ask for a standard. Yes. As there is the, the SPDX. Um, is there also a process at the moment already ongoing that uh, package providers need to conform uh, this standard? It have a because manual uh, work is not something we look forward to, especially law concerning stuff. We like to be occupied with technology. Um, and um, as a, uh, companies like uh, GitHub, is there, maybe you know about um, a process or the initiative to uh, force uh, software makers and PEX providers to yeah. the, um, I mean the, only can uh, publish on GitHub if they conform this time? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's quite a few initiatives that look into um, the, the compliance process for open source projects. Um, Luckily enough, we have standards on the market. That's the first thing. But I mean, what you want to tell is that people should be aware that these standards are there and someone needs to push it right. Um, the Free Software Foundation is heavily pushing for that. Like, for example, look at the reuse standard in these topics, telling open source projects how to state copyright and license information and also provide the proper tooling. So this is one example of initiative. I highly encourage each and anyone who's, who's doing compliance data, like what we also do with the Oslo project, if you identify an issue, not just blindly, um, I mean, document it and take your assumption, just talk to the maintainers and tell, well, there's unclear license information and in your source tree, right? What did you mean? And I would recommend that you clearly state that, right? It's um, the way how you would, would work together. So there's um, a few different initiatives doing that, but not that one generic. I mean, a good example is the Linux kernel. Um, did improve a lot over the last years. So there's a clear rule for everything new you do in the Linux kernel. It's clear that you need to use a SPDX license uh, identifier. I scanned a lot of Linux versions over the year and you see that um, you, you have a clear reduction of unlicensed files and you see a high increase of the usage of SPDX license identifiers. So um, this is a, a project where other people could, could look at and, and make an example. But I mean, the only thing is we need to keep on telling and teaching people how to do it. Hope, hope that answered your question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we're really over time. Uh, thank you again so much. And once again, I'll be around for the rest of the week. So if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out. So, thank you.